Hello and welcome to yet another instalment of our Nucleus Wealth Insight series. Just a quick reminder that the following presentation is general information only and does not take into account your personal circumstances. Whilst Nucleus Wealth aims to present informing and sometimes entertaining content, please consult your investment professional, financial advisor, or better yet, speak to us before making any decisions based on any of the themes discussed in today's presentation. And don't forget that this is a live presentation, so feel free to drop any questions you like in the chat box below and we can answer them along the way. If you're watching this after the event, make sure you attend the next one so you too can participate in the live Q&A section of our presentation. Our presenters today include myself, Tim Fuller, a certified financial advisor who's worked with hundreds of clients over the years, helping to make the complex simple for companies such as AMP, Mercer and independent advisories. Sitting across from me, we have David Llewellyn Smith, co-author of The Great Crash of 2008 with Ross Garneau, also the founder of internationally acclaimed Diplomat magazine, and now chief editor of the enormously popular macro business financial blog. We also have Leith Van Onstelen, our resident nucleus wealth economist, who has spent time with both the federal and Victorian treasuries, along with some time as an analyst with Goldman Sachs. Leith now co-authors the widely read macro business financial blog with David Llewellyn Smith. And finally, we have Nucleus Wealth's Head of Investments, Damien Klassen, who's 25 years in the world of finance, has seen him as the founding partner and head of research at analyst firm Aegis Equities, head of quantitative strategy at Wilson HTM, and was responsible for mining, energy, and big data in the $60 billion global quantitative equity fund at Schroders, who are a multinational asset management company. And for more information, of course, please check out our people section at www.nucleuswealth.com. So hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. Uh, and this week we're going to be looking at the next iteration of uh, Australia's favourite boom uh, and now well and truly bust in the, Australia, the Great Australian House Crash. Uh, we've got a, uh, a, a terrific range of uh, graphs Put, put together for you. Uh, we've got a full house here in uh, our Chief Economist, Leith Van Onselen. G'day, Leith. G'day, Tim. G'day, everyone. And we have our Chief Strategist in David Llewellyn-Smith. Welcome, David. Hi, Tim. And uh, finally, Nucleus Wealth and MB Fund Head of Investments, Damien Klassen. Hi, Tim. Howdy, howdy. All right, so let's jump into it. So we've got uh, our agenda today. So we're going to look uh, initially at an, a national overview. We'll then uh, parlay that into some peak to trough comparisons uh, with some previous uh, house price pullbacks over the last few decades. We'll then jump into some short term indicators, uh, in particular auction clearance rates, investor commitments and sales volumes. We'll then have a quick look at foreign buyers, uh, what can be done by way of policy responses, and then of course what's next uh, and how we parlay this into investment uh, implications and how we run money every day for the MB Fund and for Nucleus Wealth. So with no further ado, uh, let's get into it. So uh, Leith, uh, we've gone from trading uh, crack houses for cryptocurrency now to uh, drinking coffees and listening to crickets at, at auctions. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Look. Um Everyone, everyone here knows that the housing market's coming off pretty hard, especially if you live in Sydney and Melbourne. And obviously, if you live in Perth, uh, you know, you've been experiencing this for, for quite a number of years. Um, now, I've, I've got a chart up here, which just I just want to give a quick state of play about where we're at currently in the cycle. And uh, I've just put up a chart here, um, which shows the annual price growth across the five major capitals. And as you can see, uh, prices are falling pretty hard across most of the markets. Um, over the past year, uh, Sydney's lost uh, nearly 8%. Um, their, their dwelling values have fallen nearly 8%. Melbourne's down about 55 and Perth's down about 4%. And uh, at the five city levels, that's the five major markets, the housing market's down uh, about 5.5%. So it's, um, it's, it, it's quite a big decline. And if anything, it's actually getting worse. Um, the next chart here uh, shows the uh, quarterly price growth across, again, the five major markets. And the quarterly price growth is actually falling. Uh, so it's, it's, it's getting worse, it's not getting better. Um, the losses are, are actually accumulating at a faster rate. 
And over the quarter, Sydney's lost 2.5%. Uh, Melbourne's lost about 2.2% and so is Perth and at the 5C level we're down nearly 2% so if anything the pace of, pace of losses is getting um, getting a bit more nasty and uh, and then this takes us to um, the next chart which shows the peak to loss the, the, the decline since since uh, the respective peaks in the markets and um, I think it's at the next oh, there chart. we go oh, oh sorry. sorry there we go <laughs> yeah sorry about that uh, yeah so, so I've got a chart here which then shows um uh, the sorry, can you go back one tip? Yeah, sure. There we go. Thanks. Um, yeah, so uh, so we've 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 got a chart here which uh, which basically shows the declines since uh, the most recent recent peaks, and Sydney's actually hit nine uh, percent. So since the market peaked just over about fifteen or sixteen months ago, Sydney's now lost nine percent. So it's it's quickly approaching double digits, and, and that's median as well. So there's plenty of places that have fallen. Yeah, fifteen twenty percent. That's and, right. It's and the, others that have only fallen sort of five. Yeah, absolutely. Well, th- th- this is the this is the um, he- he- the CoreLogix hedonic index. Mm-hmm. So it's um, it actually measures like for like. So um, there are other measures which show similar from you know domain or uh, from from ABS which hasn't come out yet. But that that uses just a more a simple stratified median. Um, but again, yeah, Sydney's down down nine uh, percent since peak. Uh, Melbourne's down about five and a half. And uh, and Perth's actually um, you know get, getting close to fifteen percent now, um, so we're looking at some pretty heavy losses here. And at the five C level, we're down about five and a half percent. So um, you know again, we're only just over a year into it, and uh, but the pro- the losses are really starting to mount. Mm. Um, now just to put a perspective on on where we where we compare. Uh, versus previous cycles. Uh, I've got a chart here which just shows the declines since peak versus um, versus past corrections back to the early 1980s. And just just to make it clear, out the current ones, the the black line. On That's this right. One. Yep. Yeah. So so we're about sort of um, the duration of this this decline is actually the the third longest, but the uh, actually quantity of the declines about you know midway compared to the uh, previous cycles. Going back to the eighties, so you know it, it's not that severe yet, obviously. Uh, although it is starting to drag on, and it is starting to become severe. So um, I guess that, uh, that, that's obviously a bit bifurcated between um, Sydney, Melbourne on one hand, and and some of the other cities holding up better, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. I if mean, you look at the, if you see those charts for Sydney and Melbourne, they're much closer to more steeper corrections. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look the. Um, Obviously, you know, Brisbane, Adelaide and these other smaller markets are holding up a lot better. Perth's obviously been in a funk for a long time and you don't even want to see the chart for Perth. It's an absolute disaster. Mm. Uh, it's the longest correction they've had uh, and it's also the by far the deepest they've had in, uh, you know, data going back to the 80s. But I haven't bothered to do that today just because uh, I didn't want to get it, you know, get, get into too much detail and maybe do another one of them later on. Uh, but, but I guess Adelaide and Brisbane didn't have the, the sort of final blow-off in, in prices as well. So they sort of, I guess it's... From a yeah, if you pick the right points, you know, I guess it's probably Sydney and Melbourne probably look similar to to, to Adelaide and Brisbane. You're, you're basically saying you, you take those, take out the peak, yeah, yeah. take out yeah. the peak, and and so you've had peak a to trough, though. bigger bigger yeah. rise, bigger fall. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the the, the last the, the, this cycle in the last five years has been really purely a Sydney and Melbourne issue. Like Sydney and Melbourne just kept you know rose up while the rest of the country didn't do a whole lot, and actually Perth went backwards. So. Uh, yeah, th- this has been fully driven by Sydney and Melbourne mm-hmm. at the moment, which is why um, the, the, the rest of the charts today basically just focus on Sydney and Melbourne. Okay. Uh, per- Perth's been falling for years and it's, you know, the story hasn't really changed there. The big story in the last year or so has been Sydney and Melbourne, which okay. has gone from boom to bust. Sure thing. All right, well, um, let's jump into um, some short-term indicators then. So we've got the Sydney uh, auction uh, clearance rate versus the price growth uh, chart up there, Lee. Yeah. So um, what what I want to do now is just go through the sort of the best uh, short term indicators for the housing market. So 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 this doesn't focus on you know structural supply, undersupply, any of that sort of stuff. Um, this is just looking at you know what's happening right now and what the best indicators are to tell us where we are right now in the cycle and what's likely to happen in the you know in the near term. Um, the the first the first indicator is auctions, auction clearances. Uh, auction clearances are probably the best immediate indicator you get every week mm. um, they're not necessarily the most perfect but they are the best sort of short-term indicator and looks pretty perfect yeah it does yeah <laughs> I, i've done two charts here now this was um the, 
this is uh, a, a new data series I've developed, which is basically um, you know tracking the auction clearance rates. I've smoothed them out, um, you know, averaged out each, each month, done them on a three month, uh, you know, three three monthly basis, just mm -hmm. to smooth out the volatility. And as you can see, there's an incredibly strong correlation between auction clearance rates and uh, and dwelling price growth. And uh, having said that, though, it's 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 interesting to note that. Uh, in the earlier years, the auction clearance rates certainly led that that chart. Whereas for the last what six months, not oh, sorry, maybe even twelve months, it's sort of almost as if we've uh, the price have continued to fall. Auction clearance has ticked up a little bit there, but but um, but that sort of didn't even put a dent in, in prices. So it's, it almost makes that chart look as if it's a, a lagging indicator rather than a leading indicator. Mm. On this cycle, yeah. On this cycle, yeah. On, on this last month, it's got a couple of months. Yeah, on the, yeah, in the last couple of months. But I mean, look, you know, if, if, you, if you take a long term view, if you go back ten years, it's a pretty damn strong correlation. Um, yeah, hard to deny, deny that. I mean, you could, you could, uh, if you wanted to be a real pedant, which Damien's being, um, you could put that down towards uh, possibly foreign buyer, the foreign buyer influence. Yeah, because we saw we saw all these dislocations in Sydney and Melbourne from traditional data relationships, mm -hmm. and if if it were exiting Chinese buyers that kicked off the price correction and then auction clearances started to chase them lower. Um, that might explain that. But mm. I guess what I'm flagging is it's, it, it's, we, had, we had a rise in auction clearances, was that about a year ago? But mm. it didn't, didn't actually do anything for prices. Prices kept, kept headed down through it. Yeah. Mm. So, so. Just, just a quick one before we jump into the Melbourne. Um, how much faith do you put in auction clearance Data as a guy that reads the, the data. Do you, is there any way that you can check? Obviously, it's I, not it's not regulated in any no, way, is it? It's no, self police. I, I, I used to put very little faith into it okay. uh, when it was uh, domain doing it uh, because they used to collect a tiny, tiny sample. Mm. And um, and I mean, it might have also been because Dr. Andrew Wilson was the one doing it, and he's uh, yeah, he's, he's a little bit um, bullish, sketchy. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> worst thing. But but since 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 CoreLogic's um, been doing it in the last couple of years, and they've been using CoreLogic's data, it's a lot better. Okay. Um, now it's not perfect. Like the um, you know CoreLogic does their preliminary results on uh, on Sunday, which they release, and they've always got heaps of missing auctions in there. Mm. And then but then they release on Friday on um, Thursdays they release their final results. And that includes, it still only includes about 75% of all auctions that actually took place. So there's still a lot of missing there. And so what do they but, get reported as? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, we don't know. Um, but it, it, it's, you know, it's a lot better than it used to be. And it's still not perfect. There's still you know, a lot of missing auctions, obviously. Mm. But I mean, um, as, long, as long as the methodology is consistent, yeah, that's mm, right. Like, it's it, still it, going to be useful. Yeah, it's, like. a little, it's a little bit like, you know, if, if, you, if you look at a Chinese data or whatever, it's none of it's, none of it's perfect, but, but you look for the rates of change, yep. right? And, and that so it gives you the, yep. gives you the trends. Yeah, fair and, enough. And I think these these charts. Um, have you put Melbourne up yet? I will. Yep. So I've got Sydney and Melbourne there. Uh, there is a you know incredibly strong correlation between clearances and price, prices. And I, I look at that and I go, well, you know, that's a pretty good indication. It's not perfect, but it's the best near term indicator we've got. And um, as you can see, clearances in both cities are crashing mm. uh, down in the low forties, uh, levels we haven't seen since about two thousand twelve, which is when the last you know. Uh, decent downturn in property prices took place so it's certainly not looking good and um, in fact the final clearances that came out today were uh, for last weekend were actually the worst since 2012. And what so number? That, uh, Melbourne came in at 41% Wow. Sydney was 42 and nationally I think we're down I think 41 or 42. So, so that's that's lower than the GFC taking off? Yeah, yeah well, it said, well it said it was, said it was the, the lowest since uh, June 2012 so um, yeah it's pretty bad. So yeah, it's then, consistent with with ten percent plus price falls per mm. annum. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Anyway, yeah. So I guess, I guess I guess the upshot of this is auction clearance rates are tanking. They've got a high correlation, and that doesn't all go well for house prices. Mm. Okay, sure thing. So we'll jump into um, the investor side now, and um, mentioned the GFC before, but the investors' um, the commitments are looking fairly similar to what we saw ten years ago. Yeah. Look at. Uh, I've used um, the. I could have put up either housing finance versus price growth or investor finance versus price growth, and there's actually a much stronger stronger correlation between investor finance. But they both show show a similar story. Basically, um, you know, this these, these charts go back to the early '90s, 
and they show that there's, um, you know, just like auction clearances, but even more, more so, there's a very strong correlation between you know, investor finance commission, uh, commitments and price growth. And, and, and so what, what you're saying there, I guess, just to put in layman's terms for people, is that your, your marginal investor, so the, so the person who's driving the price is, is the investor that's that, that's sort of pushing the price up and down. So the sort of, yep. I guess where we're, where we're headed here is that there's sort of an underlying <coughs> demand for places for people to live. And then when investors can, can borrow lots of money and, and want to jump out there and, and bid up house prices, then then you see house prices rise, and when investors aren't out there bidding up house prices um, and, they're, and they're pulling back from the market, you see so you see housing prices fall. Yep, mm. spot on. And, and you can see that very clearly in the data. As the investor demand goes up, so the investor finance growth goes up, prices go up. As it falls, prices fall. And at the moment, it's it's tanky. And, and have you got any recent data on? I know when we had Phil Sue's on a little while ago, we we're sort of talking to the investors were sort of over 50% of the, the market. We're, have we got any recent stats on, on where investors sit um, at the moment? Hi, Phil, if you're listening in too. Yeah, uh, certainly do. Um, the the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics releases that. It's, it's always lagged by a few months, okay. but the most recent data showed uh, it was still over 50% in Sydney right? and about just over 40% in Melbourne. And, that, and, that's, and that's down from peak when Sydney was about 60% mm. or just over 60% and Melbourne was about 50%. So they're, they're still very sizable chunks of both markets. It's extraordinary when you think that negative gearing is going to get the job. Yeah, oh, mate, it's, it, 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 it's uh, yeah, it, it's, I'm licking my lips. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Um, we jump so, into Melbourne? Yeah, so cities have crashed. Uh, finance commitments have crashed. Melbourne's have crashed. Very strong correlation prices. There was a, there was a short dislocation uh, a couple of years ago um, in, in the series, and again, that probably gets down to massive share of foreign buyers that we had, and a lot of them were, would, have, would have been uh, accessing the housing market outside the, the Australia's credit system, mm-hmm. whether that's through suitcases of cash, uh, whatever. Um, so that was you know, propelling price growth when finance actually wasn't going up. But um, irrespective of that, finance is crashing both markets means house prices will very likely keep falling uh, irrespective of the auction clearance rates um, ne- next uh, next good indicator is uh, transaction volumes so um, sales volumes again I uh, got data going back to um, you know about 20 years and very very strong correlation this all comes from CoreLogic um, Sydney's sales volumes are down by about a third since uh, since the last peak and Melbourne's are down by about uh, a quarter, um, and uh, Sydney sales volumes are plumbing levels not seen since about the GFC, uh, as are Melbourne. And, so, and, and so putting this into context, I guess the the relationship here is that when um, when prices are high, people feel more confident and they they flip the house and and, and sell and 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 are happy to trade them and, and there's a lot of demand and I guess when demand pulls back people don't like to take a loss on their on their house and they sort of so they they sort of figure well I'll, I'll just hold on to my house for a bit longer and, and wait it out so you sort of see the I guess that's that's the correlation I guess yeah and also obviously uh, yeah l- less less demand from buyers as well so people sit on their hands and don't want to don't want to enter as well so that also the impacts and so just a, just a quick question on this one um, the so the sales data where does that come from uh, so the sales data comes from well it's from CoreLogic but it comes okay. from the um, from each of the the land titles offices right so it's pretty reliable oh yeah yeah it's, it's, yeah. it's just lagged unfortunately um, the data we get is uh, th- lags prices by about three months yep okay so. Yeah, so so we've only got data up to I think April or May. No, May I think it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but irrespective, it shows that the um, you know r- very strong correlation and sales volumes in both markets are tanking. And this is not just bad news, obviously for um, for the housing market, or great news if you're a buyer, but um, very bad news for both state governments, who are um, incredibly reliant on uh, on on stamp duties and property taxes to prop up their budgets. Mm. And obviously if transaction volumes tank at the same time as prices tank, um, you know, we're, we're looking at multi-billion dollar holes in both the New South Wales and Victorian budgets, mm. which you know, which will, which will uh, stifle their ability to you know, build all the infrastructure and whatever they have to to keep up the population Ponzi. Mm-hmm. And uh, hello austerity down the track, so. Good times ahead. No, Melbourne. 
So, so, and I think it's probably worth, we, we spoke a bit about this last week, but just, it's just this, the, the main issue we see here is um, pro-cyclical in, in terms of when house prices are going great, then you get lots of these transactions happening, which means there's lots of stamp duty, which, which means governments are, have got all this cash and they're, they're, you know, they're sitting there trying to spend it <clears throat> at, at peaks of the cycle. And then when things turn and, 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 and downturn, which is, which is when you'd want governments to actually be out there and supporting and, 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 and um, actually up. increasing their, their yep. spending, um, is when they haven't got any more money left. And so now it's all about, um, for, for, from a state level, we've seen in, in a number of different countries, um, and the US is probably a good example, that, that all the states want to try and pull back. And the federal government might be keen to try and get more out there and, and be trying to convince people to, to spend, but at the state level where most of this infrastructure spending happens, um, yeah, they're just sort of shell-shocked and, and you know trying to balance their budgets. Yeah, mm. it's, bas- it's basically kind of like a version of the wealth effect. So, you know, this is why property is so important. It uh, creates a wealth effect for uh, for households and consumers because as their, as their assets go up, the prices go up, they borrow against their homes, they spend more. Mm. But also, similar impact for the governments. Uh, for state governments who are so reliant on property taxes and property values go up there's more turnover they get more stamp duty revenue they can funnel it out into spending and uh, obviously the reverse happens when prices fall yeah and when you say property taxes it's transaction property taxes that are the issues property taxes are sort of a flat a flatter fee levied sort of per year would actually work out a lot a lot better for people yeah because it because it smoothed out these changes and whereas um if you're just putting you're basically piling up all the uh all all the responsibility for for um, for your budget to, to people who want to trade houses or, or have to trade houses because they've just had you know, more kids or mm. yeah, and, which is, which is not, a, not, a, not a sustainable long-term solution. Yeah, well, so stamp duty is the worst kind of tax for this because it's, it's, you know, it's dependent on not just trend, uh, sales volumes but also prices. So it's, it, it is inherently very pro-cyclical. And just Boom a quick bust. one, but you're, I mean, you've also got you know, very uh, inept slash corrupt governments who are doing the opposite of what they say they're going to do and should do, which is obviously make savings during the boom and then stimulate during the bust. But at the state level, you know, they do the opposite. In fact, federally, they do the opposite as well a mm. lot of the time. But uh, so, you know, a lot of this is, is uh, simply bad politics too. Is it a product, uh, product of um, if you're saving now and copying the boom, they're just giving it to the next government to spend and... Uh Oh, and absolutely. <laughs> yeah, throwing, 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 from, a, from a politician's perspective, you're throwing away votes if you're not spending the, spending the money as fast as you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so. yeah, I've got some sympathy for the state governments. They, the, um, they're obviously being, you know, force-fed. Um, in the case of city and Melbourne, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of extra people uh, through, you know, big Australia policies. So they've got to build the infrastructure. Mm. They don't really have a choice. Just a quick one on, just finally on this, uh, on the sales volumes is... Obviously, you've got a stat there, sort of, you know, what, 90-odd thousand in 1998 versus 70-odd thousand 20 years later. Um, obviously, Melbourne's grown significantly in that time. Is it maybe a, a graph for later date where we have it based on the number of um, properties that are actually in the city as, as a percentage or something, maybe, so you could see... Rather than tracking up, it might be tracking we, down. We had this yeah. exact, so exact <laughs> conversation maybe an hour or two ago, just talking about the you know about how these are the these are your raw numbers and give you a better feel for the overall perspective. But but yeah, if you if you, if you adjusted, then we'd um, no, on a per capita basis we're 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 at you know whatever it is twenty thirty year lows. Yeah, I mean pr- probably a better way to do it than per capita is just to do it as a um, yeah percentage of. Total. Oh, of, of total homes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. on that. Yeah, so, so turnover rate. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and there's no doubt the turnover rate would have crashed. Mm. And part of that is because, um, because the, the, the way stamp duty works is that the thresholds are pretty much fixed. Mm. So as prices rise, the stamp duty rates, or well, the, the average stamp duty goes up, and then mm. that becomes a disincentive to buy and sell. So that, that would explain part of it. Oh, well, that's uh, yeah. It could be a quality yeah. graph for uh, for our next iteration yeah, of the uh, the great housing crash. Thanks, guys. It's about five hours work in that. <laughs> Appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> that's three for you, Lee. <laughs> All right, foreign buyers. Yeah. So um, look, this this charts come from Gareth Ed, um, legendary economist at the CBA, uh, who um, who compiled this data recently, and it basically tracks uh, foreign buyers as measured by the uh, NAB foreign buyer survey against property prices and it shows that um, that there's a pretty strong correlation between price growth and foreign buyers uh, although albeit not you know obviously not perfect and um, 
And what it suggests is that, uh, the, that the percentage of foreign buyers for Australian property has fallen from about 12%. Um, you know, mid, mid 2015 to about 6% currently. So it's roughly halved. So about, about a halving in foreign, foreign demand. And, uh, and that's obviously um, you know, helped to mitigate uh, prices. And uh, it's, just, it's just another short term fact that foreign buyers are pulling out of the market. Um, we've got less Chinese money flowing in, which other things equal means that we should get lower price growth going forward and uh, should drag down property prices. So it's just, you know, it's just another, another one of these short term factors. Mm, okay, absolutely. Just had a, a quick one here, just as a note, um, and once again, maybe for a, a future uh, iteration. But the uh, just the impact on some of the secondary cities um, and the the boom or and now bust. Have you um, you've got the capacity to provide some data on that, perhaps at a, at a later date? Uh, so, so yeah. Wollongong, Geelong, sort of the sort of satellite but sell secondary cities. Yeah, I, I wish I could. Um, I don't know, I don't actually have the data. Yep. I, I've only got data at the um, at the capital city levels, so okay. uh, I don't have any um, data on the small small regions. Yeah, right. Okay. So, right. Gen- yeah. Generally speaking, you could say they've been booming mm. um, as locals got priced out during the last booms in Sydney and Melbourne. Mm. Uh, and they've had a longer tail on that because people have continued to move out there. Uh, but Geelong, for instance, the auction clearances there have started to steepen down very quickly now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, it's the same in Sydney satellites. They always lag. They lag, but they will they will track the bigger cities. Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know anecdotally uh, Geelong's typically been a refuge for people priced out and also for downsizers. Um, yep. that are coming, you know, that are retiring and then moving down to the coast and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. Yeah, we also know just from international experience, we know that, you know, in places like California, um, the um, the inland empire, so your San Bernardinos, et cetera, which are, you know, about 100 miles away from, or well, 100 k's away from uh, from San Francisco, et cetera, they, they all boomed very late in the US housing bubble. Mm-hmm. And they also the ones that got decimated when it busted because they tend, only, tend to be lower income and, uh, you know those desperate people who couldn't afford to buy in San Fran and had worse job prospects. So it's probably you know, it's probably a similar case here with Geelong, the place like Geelong and probably Wollongong and maybe Newcastle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know these places that are about an hour away from the city, they get yeah as, as you guys have said, they get a lot of the um, you know the people priced out and and a lot of them then commute back into the city mm. as well. So um, yeah, it's not it's not un, not unusual. They lag and then they get hit hard later on. Uh, a little bit of pressure off the V-line train from uh, Geelong, which I think a few <laughs> yeah. people will be happy to hear. Sorry, Ken. Okay, sure. So let's roll into um, some policy responses. Uh, is the government to the rescue? Uh, maybe we should reverse these and do the head- headwinds. headwinds. Headwinds first. Okay, yeah. you'd like to yeah. do that one first? Okay. Yeah. We'll jump into the headwinds yeah. then. Yeah, so... Uh, all right, so head- headwinds, are, as, as Leith has made pretty clear, uh, headwinds are pretty stiff, uh, and if anything, stiffening. Uh, so uh, we've got you know a credit crunch of some sort going on. And, and actually, uh, can I just preface before you jump into this? Mm. Um, so we've got a, we've got sort of five things up here, which are uh, the credit crunch, bank funding costs, uh, interest only mortgage cliff, uh, the negative gearing and, and CGC reforms from Labor, and immigration cuts. And of those, um, only three of them were up there last time we spoke. The, um, the credit crunch was still in, sort of in, in its early stages and, and the immigration cuts were still a twinkle in the, uh, the coalition's eye. In the current so, Prime Minister's eye. Yeah. Who was it again? <laughs> Could yeah, have been anybody. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That was, um, <laughs> but, and so, and so the, the, there's, there's greater headwinds than we saw, you know, even just three, month, three or four months ago. Yeah. Um, and that's certainly the case with the credit crunch alone. Um, it... It appears to be intensifying. It's uh, uh, driven primarily by the um, fallout from the Hain Royal Commission, which has resulted in rising lending standards in the major banks as they've been uh, caned from, you know, pillar to pillar. And, mm. and, and what David's talking about in terms of credit crunch is that um, what traditionally happens is in the, in the lending cycles is. Uh, you get interest rates rising and then you start getting defaults and then the banks all of a sudden, they go from shipping as much money out as they possibly can to all of a sudden wanting to, uh, to hold on to as much and being worried about property prices falling and, and people defaulting. And so they, they, um, they basically, it's, it's one of these pro-cyclical things again where they're, they're throwing out lots of, lots of credit um, 
while the while the boom's going, and then as the boom's starting to crash, they're they're, they're pulling it all back. And so, so that's where um, that's where we're at at the moment. Which we haven't really had the interest rate rises, but it's more been a a royal commission driven credit crunch. Uh, well, it's two things. I mean, it's also uh, the, the, we started with. Um, prudential tightening from APRA, but we'll come back to that. The, what, what's really driven the, the recent crunch and the steepening of house price falls uh, has been the Royal Commission, as Damo says, and we've seen just in the last couple of weeks, um, we've seen ANZ and CBA both come out and say, we'll, we will, will not be um, putting out what were effectively subprime or liar loans in the past in future. Um, well, the, the, the Royal Commission basically exposed that the four major banks were issuing somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of their loans with, in, with inadequate documentation mm. in effect, where they were not assessing expenses and income correctly, they were using benchmarks and stuff which were radically underestimating people's costs, overestimating income, all sorts of dodginess going on through the broker channels. Uh, etc etc and that's they've been caught red-handed with all this stuff uh, and you know that the biggest bank in the country the bellwether has said 30 percent of its book is colored by this stuff and so those practices have, are just gone shut down uh, so they're all putting in much more stringent um, uh, uh, screening processes for borrowers and that's an implicit rising of lending standards mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. It just means that people are going to get a lot, a lot fewer people are going to get credit, and a lot fewer people, will, and and people will get less credit because mm. you'll just get much more realistic assessments of repayment prospects. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's probably the primary driver at the moment of the credit crunch. That actually came as a secondary, on top of the macro prudential, which was already underway from APRA, which was happening in lieu of rate rises. Uh, and what what that was was. Um, uh, the prudential regulator just uh, was forced finally by campaigning by MB and others <laughs> and just the sheer magnitude of the bubble blow off in Sydney and Melbourne to to clamp down on some of the crazy lending practices pre Royal Commission mm. and the main target of that was firstly inter uh, investor loans and then second a second round for interest only loans. Uh, now there, there's a little bit of good news on that front. This is where we come to the interest only mortgage cliff, which is another headwind. Um, through the last boom, you know, the, one of the major sources of new credit that drove up for house prices was it was a, a, just a very big interest only blow off. Mm. Like that's where, uh, you know, the investors really went nuts in this particular boom. Uh, because it was really the only way they could actually afford any of the extraordinary prices. Yep. Uh, and so once that got chopped off, uh, and APRA said, you know, banks had to reduce the number that they were issuing in their books, um, you have, you know, a lot of these interest-only uh, mortgages have a, um, uh, a period uh, where they reset later. Mm -hmm. about to, five years. To, most of them are three or five years. Right. Uh, and you have this sort of uh, you know honeymoon period then it resets to principal and interest uh, and so the boom ran from sort of 2013 to 2017 and then so when you clamp down on that you've then got four years of reset um, the good news is uh, that the banks have been actually chewing through that ahead of schedule mm. so they've been converting people to interest to interest and principal faster than the actual scheduled reset suggests. So, uh, you know, that suggests a certain amount of de-risking, but there's, there's price to pay for that in falling falling house prices. And, and arguably as well, there's there's also a, you, you sort of say, if, if I have a book of, whatever, 100 people who I need to reset to, to principal and interest from, from interest only, and I'm trying to do it faster, I'm going to be able to reset the, the guys who are actually making enough income to, to to principal and interest sooner than I will like, in theory the ones that I've got left are, are going to be the worst ones because they're the ones yeah, that maybe. I, I might have tried to mm. convert but I couldn't because they just, just literally didn't have the money to do it and they yeah. just said no 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 sorry I'm so you just kick that down the road I'm, <laughs> I'm taking my full you know if you give yeah. me five years I'm I'm doing you well know. If, I mean if that's true you're going to end up with a kind of toxic asset problem yeah. a bit like the US you know where you mm -hmm. you you're you're kind of managing your loan book in a way 
and chopping and changing things yeah that that just ends up concentrating risk maybe so so that yeah. glass no, could, no, no, could it's possible could be yeah. half full could be half empty yeah, it's hard yeah to, it could be yeah, yeah. yeah. Good point. We, we just had a quick question um on uh interest rates so i've got a, a comment here martin north sees interest rates going up <laughs> obviously yeah. not in uh the na- our, our current narrative so uh maybe he's right and you guys are wrong well of course he, he might be right i mean paul Bloxham might be right but i, I wouldn't bet on it uh, it'd be suicidal like, it, it, it'd be suicidal the rba would love to reload the cannon we know we all know that but as ray dalio says what well, what the hell's the point in putting up interest rates just so you can pull them down again mm. i mean it's it's really obvious that the economy's slowing now um, from you know what we described as the botox boom over the last year which has been very very fiscal uh, oriented or mm. fiscally driven fiscally fiscal spending driven uh, uh, and now you know retail isn't falling off a cliff but it's clearly slowing and heading towards a stall um, dwelling construction is falling dwelling construction is falling um, all the leading indicators on employment are, have rolled yep uh, and are falling now some of them are still at quite reasonable levels, sort of average levels, mm. um, but the trend is all down yep. in all of them. Uh, I mean, wage growth has hardly gotten off the canvas. Mm. And I think our, our overarching thesis has been that um, you know, the, the, the RBA rolled us out of a mining boom that they thought was going to last a long time. Um, and so they, then they cut rates and, 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 and basically looked the other way while banks shoveled as much credit as possible out the door for, um, for a number of years to, 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 to blow a housing boom yep. and to, to, to get us over the, the, the hump of that mining boom. And then the next thing is, is saying, well, what's, what, what's, ne- what's going to take over as, as that finishes? And, and they've sort of had the view that, oh, the rest of the economy will kick into gear and, and, and it'll lift us off. And that... Um, we've sort of always been of the view that that, that wasn't going to happen, and that you didn't have enough. There wasn't enough ammunition there, and and that as um, you know, as the housing boom sort of wound off, that that you you headed into a uh, an economic downturn, and you wouldn't be raising rates. And so um, they've been talking about raising rates for years, and just keep pushing it out further and further and further. And our our view is that eventually that they'll have to give up and and, and go the other way. But, was- but the RBA is still definitely talking about raising rates, which is why yeah. you have Martin North and other people and most most economists. It's probably a handful of economists who are talking about lowering rates. The vast majority of people are, are taking it from None. the, the there's, RBA. There's, there's us and, and Stephen Kukulis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas, where, whereas Bill Evans is saying just on hold for the next three years. Basically. Yeah. That's yeah. right. And, and, but we haven't spoken much about inflation. Well, there is. No, there's not. <laughs> I mean, there's none. We, 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 we've struggled for five years to get any. They got a few pips. Into yeah, we just. It. It's still below the RBA's. Well, yeah, that's right. And um, I mean, not that you know they'll cut because it's under the RBA ban. You know, like Phil Lowe's made that clear, but you know, they would certainly like to see more inflation, and and it's peaked. Yeah, mm. and in fact, I, I, <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure the last the last CPI rating was actually the lowest it's been for decades. Or something. Mm. So it's um, and, and, and we've also got to remember that the the banks have been doing their own tightening, mm. you know, out of cycle with the yeah. RBA. So. Just makes it even harder. Yeah, yeah. So how can there's you? Just, there's an ice blocks chance in hell they're going to hike rates, and there's a very good chance they're going to be forced to cut. Mm. Yeah, but the only other thing is the RBA doesn't seem to, from every, from all indications, the RBA doesn't seem to get that this that this housing corrections building mm. and it's going to get worse. They've been pretty, you know, panglossian about it. So you just never know. Maybe, maybe they get blindsided and they'll do the wrong. They'll they'll hike them when they shouldn't. And, and it's also worth noting the timing. They do, they're stupid. The timing. So they've got another meeting coming up in another week or two, and then that's it for two months. Yep. And so um, you know, the, the RBA usually likes to, to, to give a bit of forward notice. And so if they don't hike, or if they don't start giving forward notice at the next meeting, then they're two months away from starting to give forward notice. And, and, and maybe there's, if a credit current int- intensifies in the meantime, maybe it's, yeah. yeah makes things worse. In, in terms well, you, you're going to see housing prices continue to fall for the time being. You don't get the Hain report until February. Election. The banks are, are basically on tenterhooks until then in terms of installing any new lending policy. So it runs right to and through until then. Then you get the Victorian election. Oh, yeah, Victorian well, elections this it, week. Sorry, the New yep, South Wales. Yep. Yep. You get New South Wales election. We're getting the Victorian one this week. And then the federal in May. And then negative gearing. And negative <laughs> gearing goes. I mean, you know, what, what, like, what, what central bank's going to hike into that? Mm. Like, that is a gale. Yeah. You know, the economy is slowing now and it's going into that. 
I mean, they are not going to hike. And I tell you what, you don't boost housing construction by raising in- in- interest rates. You know, if that's what they want to do. Yeah. So it's just, um, I just can't see it happening. Yeah. But okay. again, look, you know, you never know. They're, we could be wrong. But yeah. Oh, look, the, the key question is whether they cut. I think. I, th- I think the idea that they're going to hike is ridiculous. Mm. Yep. Um, it's just a matter of how much of a correction are they are they willing to bear in in house prices and uh, how much it hits the macro before they're forced to buckle and, and, and i think sure. I, I think when they do cut it'll be, a, it'll be like they were with macro potential where they just refuse 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 and then eventually capitulate mm. and it'll yeah. be you know it'll be a possibly you know wait way so, after the horse is bolted so mm. while we're on that subject um we should just quickly finish the headwinds and we've got bank funding costs there as well um we haven't provided a chart but um the, the rising funding costs that were largely coming out of um, short-term funding as BBSW rates mm. uh, are basically where they were uh, three months ago, more or less. Um, there's been a slight easing. Yeah. So um, the thing is probably, let's say it was sort of three steps forward and then one step back. Yeah. Yeah, in terms um, of they, they rose quite quickly, um, <coughs> pulled back a little bit, but, but the levels are still well above the levels they were and, a year ago. And more importantly for bank profits, the moving average is still coming up. Mm. Um, so uh, the banks are going to have to hike it themselves mm. again to protect net, net interest margins. So again, you know, this mitigates against any notion that the RBA is going to move mm. uh, because bank net, net interest margins with funding costs where they are will f- continue to fall for another 6 or 12 months. Uh, and, you know their share price is getting smashed mm. so they're going to want it they're going to do it if they can um okay so uh that that brings us to you know stuff we've just mentioned of course negative gearing and capital gains reforms i, I mean we think labor's obviously a shoe in for the election um they seem very firm and determined to put these policies in place i mean if we get a crash into the election might throw the cards in the air, but then you've got to crash anyway. Mm. You know, at that point. The only, uh, can I say uh, the, the only thing on that which might stifle them is they may not get a majority in the Senate, even with the Greens. I think there was some um, the yeah. Australian Institute did some did some analysis, and they reckon they probably them and the Greens probably won't have a majority. So they will have to probably negotiate with the cross cross bench. So yeah, they get who knows? That, though. Yeah, I think they would. I mean, Darren Hinch has already said he'd support it. So yeah, it should be right. And then, of course, the new one is immigration cuts, where we're, we're not certain how big they'll be, but they've been mooted now by the federal government. Um, you know, they've, they've talked about 30,000 cut. Uh, and, you know, that would actually match a, a sort of uh, mock cut that they've already done, but they've been offsetting with bridging visas. Uh, and so, so what David means there is that basically they're gaming the stats at the moment, saying, yep, saying yep. that they're cutting rates, but really just giving away different visas so that the, yep. the official stats look like immigration's falling, but but um, in reality it's very little yeah. changed. So, mm-hmm. the, so the permanent migrant intake was 30,000 less than the previous year, but the bridging visas went up 40,000. which bridging visas are handed out to people who are basically waiting for... Mm. Um, Permanent migrants, permanent, yeah. permanent migration. Infinite, infinitely rollable. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. So <laughs> they're like long-term so temporaries. Yeah. In, in five years, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of <laughs> bridging visas. visas. But yeah, I mean, we we do still think that they'll they'll they will cut immigration, or at least uh, there'll be a cut in the temporary side, which mm. will still have an impact on demand, but you know, yeah. not as. Yes, it's certainly not a positive for property value. No, and labour labour, we think, will have to do something on temporaries as well. Um, otherwise, you know, they'll have no hope of generating higher wage growth. Mm. But, but, but having said that, Labor's not... They're more likely to keep in, uh, running at the current rate or, or, you know, even increase a little. Uh, Can't say I think they'll, str- what, what no, I think they'll struggle to increase it. It's just yeah. so unpopular. Mm. But, but they would definitely sustain it, yeah. yes. Well, certainly not say that they're increasing it, but as we said, you know... You yeah, can, yeah. You can, what you're saying, what you can do. And the stats, yeah. yeah. I mean, especially if if negative if they do put negative gearing reform through, uh, and it and it hits the market hard, they'll certainly be looking at that as a way of uh, trying to offset it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and and they did they did that to an extent during the GFC where they you know where they basically allowed in foreign buyers and got rid of all those rules and you know mm. ran up immigration. So so I'll just add one more uh, headwind to that one, which is uh, where we mentioned before the foreign buyers. Uh, obviously, they're actually still declining, I think, and the likelihood is that that will continue in the foreseeable future. 
uh, as you know this this kind of burgeoning cold war between the US and China goes on and the uh, Chinese yuan comes under pressure uh, that means they'll have to manage their capital account very closely and probably tighten it even further, which means less foreign buyers. So there's very unlikely to be a, to be more foreign buyers either. Okay. Um, and then I suppose you could segue that into a possible um, final headwind, which is a potential you know global shock of of some kind hitting what is obviously already a very weak market. But, but we know we're late cycle, we just don't know when it comes. Mm-hmm. So that's obviously a vague and speculative thing, but it's, it's, it is lurking out there. Okay, sure. So we'll jump back into um, some policy responses just quickly if we've missed any. I think we covered off on a few there, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I yeah, think we've done, old, old. we've done the RBA. I mean, I think that the RBA will be forced to cut next year, personally. I think um, by the time we get through the federal election, I think the economy will be in, in serious stall mode. Um, and uh, coming out of it, you'll get, you'll get a lift of confidence coming out of it, except, you know, we'll have a new blow to, to the housing market. Uh, and I think the RBA will be forced to cut. In fact, if I was Labor, I would do the negative gearing reform and I would just put a gun to the RBA's head and yeah. make them cut. Mm. Um, so I think it, uh, two cuts next year. Half um, percent. Yep. And then, then you're really into the realms of um, zero interest rate policy. I mm. mean, you're, you're at 1% cash rate. Uh, and the RBA said it never wants to go below that. I think it would go below it if forced to, um, down to probably 50 basis points. I, and I suspect that's about as low as it, as it would go. I don't think it'd go to zero. Nobody else has in a small open economy. Um, uh, and af- after that, it starts to look at quantitative easing. Mm. Um, but it, all of those, that process is all responsive. None of I, look. Uh, I should say, I think two interest rate cuts next year, and I think that is enough to stabilise the market for a little while. Although the banks would probably hold half, keep half. They would keep half. Um, and you know, then you go through a process of 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 you know um, you're into the end of cycle, and you're, at some point you've got a, um, an external shock as well. And so you exhaust your monetary policy over the next year or two. Uh, and even though you're going to have the cuts and a bit of stabilisation, negative gearing's gone. What, where's the next pulse going to come from the housing market? Mm. Like foreign buyers are still gone. You'll have some pent up demand there, and it could could kick it along a little bit but I think it would roll over again mm. before too long uh, and then at a certain point when you get that next next end of cycle event you know I just think households look up and, and see that they've got no rate cuts left mm. and everyone just goes well that's that's the end of it thanks very much now at that point you may get quantitative easing and things but you know the, the, those will be um, mitigating factors they're not going to change the market or turn it around. Mm. You know, you're you're really into crisis mode there. Um, so I well, guess having said that, at some stage it'll fall far enough that it'll be worth buying at that stage. Uh, of you know? course it will. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Flooded, flooded with money, but yeah. yeah. I, guess, I guess the point is, there's the, the the larger point is, we're not there yet. If you if you're sort of looking at this saying, hey, this was my last opportunity to ever get into the uh, the housing market. I've got to I've got to buy now while it's down five ten percent. No way. Um, saying, look, hold on to it. Yeah. There's, um, yeah, there's there's, there's, there's just time. yeah, there's just no. I mean, it looks to me like FOMO is all over. So yeah, just 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 look at those short term indicators, you know, and then um, and then revisit when we do this in another, in another after Christmas, and mm. then yeah. after that, and after that, and once those short term indicators turn around, well, then you know maybe. Yep. So so monetary policy is pretty close to pushing on a string. Is I guess what we're saying. It's nearly exhausted. Um, macro prudential <coughs> app has already pulled out it's investor loan limits and it's done nothing in fact it's made it worse <laughs> what, what david says in terms of investor loan limits it was 10 percent. i think they're basically yeah. saying you, that banks couldn't lend above 10 percent, and because that was what was happening through that that whole period and it's that whole part about you know it's obviously credit growth that can't be sustained if the rest of the economy is growing at sort of three or four percent and and you've got this loan growth of over 10 percent, 10 to 15 percent coming into the housing market it's sort of a, a pretty good sign there's a bubble happening and then, so the APRA put on uh, limits to say no bank could go above 10%. Mm. Um, then That's 10% uh, growth, growth year on year. Year on year. Which year is still loans. ridiculously high. Yeah, yeah. same time. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so that sort of that sort of helped put a bit of the dampness on the housing market. 
uh, and then what three months ago they pulled that off maybe yeah maybe six months ago and they, yeah they then it still pulled keeps it off falling it's running about yeah. two and a half percent now so, so yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and monthly it's falling yeah, now, yeah. So. so so Macquarie was still out lending but everyone else had sort of pulled back yeah um, so you know could they pull off uh, the next thing that they would do is is take away the interest only um, uh, restrictions. Um, I don't think they'll do that in the environment of the Royal Commission. No. Um, you know that this is sort of really toxic lending. Um, uh, lie loans. It's 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 all all part of the the whole subprime debacle. So uh, I, I, I guess where we're going there with that is that it's now back to bank executives to say well. You know, if you're a bank executive and everyone else was lending this way, you know, four, three or four years ago, um, you could keep doing it and and with with a clear conscience. And well, look, you know, if we if we get done for it, we're all getting done together, and we'll hide behind the bank. But given the focus of the Royal Commission now um, has been, you know, largely on this, uh, our banks giving people loans they can't afford. Now to turn around now and as a bank say, well, we're going to go hell for leather on interest, you know, interest only. And we're going to pile as many people as we possibly can into this, and we're going to try and bring their their um, their uh, incomes. We're going to try and inflate their incomes and do all the stuff we used to do. Um, you, you're at a, a grave risk that you're going to be the only one doing it, mm. and that there's sort of jail time and, and all these other things mm. happening. So, <coughs> so I guess what we're saying is, regardless of, of whether APRA or, or the RBA or, or the, the governments would like the banks to be out shoveling as much as they can and and change the rules to to try and help them to shovel as much credit out there as they can to hold this thing up. Um, you're, you're, we're trying to back the, the horse called self-interest, which is um, we've just had this big royal commission. There's a number of criminal, criminal potential things that could come out of it. Uh, we think most bank executives are going to be probably pretty safe for, for the next couple of years. Mm. I mean, where, where the government might be able to step in uh, is uh, and things like um, the treatment of... Um, you know whether or not some of some of these indiscretions that have transpired over the boom are actually criminal. Yes. Um, so, you know, post royal commission, the government might just simply try and snow the whole thing, and and that way, you know, for instance, um, you know, if if certain kinds of lending are, are kind of retrospectively declared criminal, then you open up all sorts of class actions and possible. Uh, Recourse for people who are losing, you know, have fallen into negative equity and have lost out on these loans, and then then you're into jingle mail territory, and really a ca- catastrophic crash, uh, and that's where the government will probably try to step in and prevent any kind of legislation that probably is needed, but in a moral sense, but you know they they would try and prevent it simply on on the basis that too many people would get hurt. Now it's actually still um, a live issue whether or not they could even stop that. That'll mm. be really down to the legal system and the Royal Commission. Mm. If the Royal Commission declares certain things criminal, uh, then the government, you know, be quite boxed in in how they uh, address the outcomes. But you know that that's just a live issue, and it's. And, and I guess what Dave's saying is there that they could always legislate. I mean, it's not not to say the Royal Commission's you know. Runs, runs a show, the government could legislate to, to, to declare these things. The Royal Commission could say these things are illegal and they could legislate to, to make them um, back to legal. Mm. But it's going to be a pretty bad look for whoever's doing it saying, you know, an independent judge coming out and saying these guys are all criminals and, and the government's coming out and legislating to say, well, let's let's change the rules so they weren't criminals. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so what, yeah. Vote like one wire I mean, yeah, loans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not yeah, impossible, you, but, you, but it's... You can uh, see the unlikely. RBA and Treasury both working on this behind the scenes, trying desperately to prevent the Royal Commission from turning into a legal debacle for the banks. And actually, an interesting point there on that one. Um, there's a question here. Do you think the, do you th- do you guys think that behind closed doors, the government and regulatory bodies are genuinely awake to what is going on, or do you think they're pretty confident that we'll have a soft landing? Uh, mm. Well, I mean, it's it's such an amorphous blob that you're referring to. It's it's hard to ascribe intention to to the government, as it were. Mm. I mean, I, I think... Um, they can't, work, can't even agree on who their leader's going to be. Is it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think they're very reactive and, you know, you get, get sort of desperate Hail Marys, like, for instance, you know, the, the new Rudd Bank 2.0, yeah. you know, where um, uh, basically falling property prices and, and the credit crunch 
uh, has cornered a bunch of developers who uh, you know have gone out and and built these enormous apartment blocks and, and what have you um, with with all the deposits and now because of the credit crunch and because a lot of it was sold to foreign buyers they can't actually get the money to pay out mm. to these developers to take possession um, and so that's really what what the um, Rudd Bank 2.0 is about is trying to bail out those developers. Do you think there's an so, avenue? So, so, I was just going to say, do you think there's an avenue with Rudd Bank 2.0 to sort of start converting this in and solving some of the ha- uh, social housing problem or something like that, where they've just got well, ready uh, built? That'd be yeah, a more sensible that, use of government money, but um, I, no, no, nah, corporate welfare. <laughs> But yeah. yeah okay. So I mean, so they're clearly aware of some of some of the texture of the bust. And, and, and I think, though, it's safe to say that, given, as you said, the RBA and Treasury are both working behind the scenes to try and, you know, keep keep things going along along the way. They, uh, yeah. They realise how dependent the Australian economy is on the, on oh, the yeah. housing yeah. market. But also, they know, so they know it needs to. They know they need to keep this thing going. Yeah. Otherwise, because because I guess what it is is they've they've blown this bubble themselves to to get us out over the mining boom because. They, they forecast the mining boom is going to last 30 years and it lasted, you know, three. And then um, <laughs> yeah. then they've come back and blown this housing bubble. So if you want to cover yourself and make sure that you don't get, you know, you don't get blamed for blowing the housing bubble and then... I think that's right. So, yeah. so we, Certainly that's the case with the RBA. Yeah, and we, and, we, and we see that also with them both, you know, spruiking big Australia, mass immigration relentlessly as well to try and keep the demand and backfill it as yeah. well. So it's, yeah. But I mean, at the same time, I reckon they I mean, I, I think they're probably also very arrogant too. They probably think, well, you know, we survived the GFC just fine. We intervene. We, you know, we solve that. If it comes around, we'll do it again. Um, there's probably a bit of that too. Yeah. I mean, they have managed their way through with the bubble on several occasions now. They've, they've kept it afloat. They, they're quite good at it. It's getting can, harder though. Can kicking is pretty... Pretty interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's, certainly gonna, that's certainly going to try. And then, then, so another other po- possible fiscal policy, obviously, is first home buyer grants. Yeah, um, access know, to super. Access to super, the usual yeah. suspects. Mm. Um, they're not going to work as well as they have in the past. In fact, house prices are crashing when we have those already in Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah, and, and also, <laughs> you've got to remember that the investor demand is about three times first home buyer demand. So for every, you know... Uh, 10% drop yeah. in invested money, you've got to juice first home buyers by 30 yeah. to offset it. Mm. More, moreover, when, or the way those things work is you, you juice the first home buyers uh, and then the investors charge in behind the first home buyers mm. and give yeah. you this amplification. Yeah. Um, but there'll be no spillover if you do it this time because the investors can't get it, get the dough. Mm. Gotcha. So it's not going to work anywhere near as well. Uh, but no doubt it'll be tried. Yeah, but when we were, you know, West of Solid, New South Wales and Victoria just did a stamp duty, um, you know, concession uh, cut last last year for first home buyers, and prices of you know Sydney's down nine percent and Melbourne's down five and a half. So didn't hasn't done a whole lot. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, sure. I, I, obviously, if things get really bad, um, you know, there is scope for broader fiscal stimulus. Um, as we said, it won't come from states. States will be will be in big trouble. Mm. Um, as their stamp duty collapse and you'll get austerity from the states um, but federally there's certainly scope to to stimulate uh, so there'll be uh, a policy response in that sense if, if the macro really gets hit uh, and you know we still do have a pipeline of infrastructure but even that is going to get more difficult because mm. the nature of this thing is when you run up a big infrastructure boom um, for it to continue to contribute to growth it has to be bigger each year <laughs> like and, and we've been actually, in truth, been doing this since the GFC, like with the NBN. Uh, and the NBN spend is starting to roll off, and mm. it rolls off faster and faster. So it's got to be replaced. From next year. And so you've got to actually re- replace that. And build on it. And, and, and then more yeah. to get any growth. And, and building a you know an, an $8 billion tunnel from one place to another doesn't, doesn't really support no. it because the, what was good with the NBN is it went out to a lot of plumbers and a lot of people digging trenches. Um, and it was and national. And national got spread out a lot. Mm. Whereas um, you spend eight billion dollars on a on a tunnel, um, you, you're spending a lot of money on on equipment and um, and you know a couple of guys to drive it, and that's about it. Mm. So, you know, the, so the, the flow on effect is nowhere near as great. So the bottom line is, uh, you know, that infrastructure boom as as it starts to ro- to roll into a plateau, um, it can keep some activity going, but it d- adds nothing to growth. Uh, so it doesn't work as stimulus at all, um, and so that'll be a, a further challenge for both federal and state governments. Um, uh, tax policy, 
Um, yeah. What do we have in there? I mean, the, the only tax policy sort of um, reform we can see is a problem, really, which yeah. is, which negative, is gear. negative gearing. And, and also, I think Labor is committed to SMSF. Yeah. Um, yeah. Shutting them off from shutting mortgages down leverage, as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, the only tax policies that we can see are, are negatives. Are, are negatives. Yeah. yeah. And unless you get a short term bring forward where people are rapidly trying to get. If you, if you are, if you are, well, that's not actually that's not entirely true. We we will see tax cuts, income yeah. income tax income. cuts. Yeah, okay. Because uh, the terms of trade are actually running quite well, uh, well ahead of budget still. So yeah. um, there will be scope for you know moderate tax cuts. But um, but obviously it's not targeted at the property sector, so no, it won't, won't offset the negative yeah, gearing no, stuff. It, that'll be aimed at the macro, trying to keep this property sector from hitting yeah. the broader economy. Mm. Um, but, and so I mean, if I was a betting man, I would say. By mid next year, Labor does do its its negative gearing reform. The RBA does cut, and um, then Labor does, you know, sort of moderately sized tax cuts as well. And they try and try and short circuit the bust mm. that, that way into the second half of next year. Mm, okay. All right. Very good. Um, we're running short on time, so we'll just finish up, of course, as always, with the investment impacts. Um, it's only yeah. a quick one, I think, today, but uh, a little bit of a, yeah. a recap on uh, our last so, uh, iteration. So, so yeah. So, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of negative um, thoughts around around that. Uh, what I just wanted to highlight, I've just got a, a chart up quickly, just showing that um, how you how you add up to the Australian index. And so, if you start with sort of direct property. Um, Places on, in the listed on the, in Australia, you don't have that many, so you sort of get about ten percent. But then once you add in the finance sector, that sort of takes you to fifty percent. Uh, then you start jumping into um, you know to, to a bunch of other things like consumer discretionary and, and things like that that are that are actually quite focused on the um, on the uh, on the housing market and, and quite so think places like Harvey Norman where they're they're highly leveraged in terms of the uh, the, the spend that happens and even stuff like um, you know. Uh, tab, uh, not tab, um, Crown, where you look at and say, well, Crown, you know, notionally it's a uh, running casinos and and so downturns and, and things like that. They should arguably more money gets gambled in in bad times, but but they're um, busy building some some a huge development in in um, in Sydney at the moment with a bunch of luxury apartments in there. So even even sort of you know a number of other ones where you'd go, no, you know. By, by rights, they shouldn't have property development exposure. They do have sort of. Property so it's infected exposure. even our gambling stocks, Dave. That's, right. That's incredible. That's right. So, um, so I guess I guess the, the thing is, you've you've got to be pretty careful if you're in a, in the um, if you if you're trying to avoid the housing uh, market in Australia, um, it's pretty hard. And you're, you're you're best off looking offshore or, or looking at government bonds, and that's where we're sort of looking at a mixture of the two, um, just in terms of saying, well, look, if we think government if we think the government bonds are going to, uh, the interest rates will be cut. Then, then there's some some benefit in holding more bonds, and um, you know avoiding the Australian market is, um, is is key. Yep. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, and on that note, let's hear some more about Nuclear Wealth. Nuclear Wealth and the Macro Business Fund was put together to help give you access to quality, well-researched stock analysis and superior macroeconomically minded asset allocation. We use technology to help us provide a service typically only available to high net worth and sophisticated investors at a fee level that rivals the more basic solutions available to everyday investors. We do this by using separately managed accounts, which allows clients to enjoy unparalleled transparency of what they own and why. It also means that each client effectively owns their own separate and discrete share portfolio managed daily by us. We have partnered with Linear Asset Management, who are backed by the ANZ Bank for Cash Management and JP Morgan, one of the biggest banks in the world, as custodian of your assets. In our new personal superannuation option, we have partnered with Premium, who is backed by HSBC as custodian and ANZ for Cash Management. We feel these structures are the gold standard for your financial protection. In addition to this, we offer 19 separate and individual ethical screens that you can use to help tailor your investment to ensure that your money is not being used to support companies that deal in areas and practices that you feel are important. By eliminating only the areas that are important to you, you avoid missing out on the potentially higher returning areas that you are ambivalent about, which are often ruled out in other broader ethical investment options currently available in the market. 
The name Nucleus comes from our ability to provide the core holdings of a client's portfolio, allowing them the time to explore areas that may be of interest or they have experience in. We also offer a complete investment solution for those who don't have the time to coordinate their own investments. Our investment team has decades of experience in world markets and we have access to a global team of stock analysts. By removing the layers of middlemen that sit between your money and the markets, we've been able to reduce fees and provide unparalleled transparency in the solution we provide. For more information on what we can do for you, please call 1300 623 863 or contact us through www.nucleuswealth.com. Yes, and um, I will also let you know that as we uh, as it stands in the last sort of three to four weeks, we have released our personal superannuation options. So everything that you uh, heard then is available now for uh, retail or personal super accounts. Uh, feel free to head over to portal.nucleuswealth.com to check all this out. You can select uh, ethics. We've got 19 different ethical screens, as mentioned before. Uh, we've also loaded up the top 40 largest super funds uh, by way of fees, so fee ranges that you can have a look at uh, if they're in there that you're uh, your fees you're paying now versus uh, something uh, through with us and of course you can also get advice uh, help in setting up the portfolio uh, to make it appropriate for your your needs uh, and also of course seeking further advice after that as well so portal.nucleuswealth.com uh, no obligation you can get all the information from there uh, coming up next week uh, same bat time same bat channel so thursday the 29th of november 12 30 p.m australian eastern standard daylight saving time uh, we're, our next topic is spotting dodgy advice so we've had a, uh, a recent uh, case drop over the desk uh, that we've had a bit of a look into and we thought let's just uh, put, I guess put that into a, a webinar topic to help uh, people out there if you're listening in in uh, some of the key things that we look for when we're uh, I guess assessing whether or not uh, people are being led astray so uh, that's of course going to be on, on Thursday and head over to the Nucleus Wealth live webinar page to, to check one, that one out so we'll see you there. As always, we are available on iTunes uh, and also where you get your quality uh, Australian financial podcasts from. Podcast Addict jumps to mind for Android. Uh, if you'd like, give us a like or uh, five stars or even write a review if you're, if you're really keen. It just helps us uh, get out there and, and get the message out there and, and uh, obviously get more listeners. So just finally, of course, as always, thanks very much for attending. Uh, we have our, our survey or, that we, we put out there, bit.ly forward slash nuclear survey, gives you an opportunity to rate the performance, how we've gone today, but of course also drop in any further topics that you'd like to hear about that we can go away, research and bring to you. So on that note, thanks very much for your attendance. It went a little bit longer than I thought it was going to, but it's a huge topic uh, and one that gets plenty of, uh, plenty of attention in the current Australian landscape. So thanks for your attendance and we look forward to catching you at the next one. Cheers.